Our speaker is a very seasoned uh, master gardener. She's a member of the class of 2012. Her primary interest is in sustainable gardening. She's well known for creating the first set of fact sheets on tried and true native plants that are now a popular resource on our website. She spent 10 years photographing native plants in public and private gardens, and she enjoys selecting pictures from that photo library to illustrate her talks. And I think you'll see that she has some fantastic photos throughout her presentation. She writes articles and does weekly educational posts for our group on Facebook, Instagram, Instagram and Twitter. And in addition, she serves as one of the coordinators for the Glen Carlin Demonstration Garden in Arlington, which many of you are familiar with. Elaine. Thank you very much, Betsy. And thank you also to my team, Leslie, Jason, and Julie, who are helping behind the scenes. Welcome everyone to our next presentation in the Sustainable Landscaping series. Today, in recognition of Pollinator Week, we're going to be celebrating this special group of animals, talking about the important role they play in our lives, and sharing information about how we can be supportive of them in our own home landscapes. We'll begin with a brief uh, review of the process of pollination and discuss the importance of pollinators. And then I'll be providing some brief uh, portraits of the pollinators that we'll hope to see in our gardens. Uh, the bulk of the talk will be focusing on native plants that will support these pollinators. Then I'll go on to discuss some best gardening practices and for those of you who uh, are restricted to maybe patio areas or balconies, I'll also have a brief discussion of container gardening for pollinators. And we'll finish up with some resources. As Betsy mentioned, I'll be taking questions at uh, several points during the talk. For a quick review, uh, pollination is simply the transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma of a flower enabling fertilization. And it can happen in two ways, either by wind pollination or by insect pollination. And of course, that's the focus of our talk today. Uh, insect pollination is a mutualistic exchange. Adult pollinators are coming to flowers seeking nectar. This is a carbohydrate energy source uh, that helps fuel their flight. Uh, in the process of seeking the nectar, some pollen will passively stick to their bodies. And then as they proceed to another flower, they will carry that pollen with them. Now, some insects are actually purposefully collecting pollen. Uh, pollen is a vital source of protein and fats for young bees. And it also provides important nutrients for female bees uh, to faci facilitate their egg production. Some flowers are actually nectarless, but they do offer large quantities of pollen. And there are uh, some other floral resources that uh, pollinators be, may be collecting. These include resin or oil, which can be used to line and waterproof uh, the nests. I love this quote from Doug Tallamy, uh, an entomologist at the uh, University of New Jersey. Uh, he says, insects are not optional. It's not okay if they disappear. Insects are the primary drivers of our ecosystems. If they go, we go. Conifers and a number of other trees such as oaks and elms and birches, as well as grasses are wind pollinated but 75% of flowering plants are going to rely on our pollinators in order to produce seeds or fruit. Many of our crops are insect pollinated. The, uh, the grains are wind pollinated, but uh, pumpkins, squash, uh, apples, cherries, almonds, and other agricultural products such as cotton and flax, plus uh, crops that we may be growing in our own vegetable garden, such as tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers, all benefit from insect uh, pollination. 
insects will also support reproduction of our ornamental garden plants, especially those that are dioecious. These are plants that have separate flowers on male and female plants. And it's important for the pollen from the male plants to be carried perhaps even some distance to the flowers on the female plants. Insects also support other wildlife. The fruits that result from pollination can be a large part of the diet of mammals and birds. And 96% of our birds consume insects, especially the easily eaten uh, caterpillars during at least one stage of their lives. Now, Betsy made reference to a handout that I've provided. And uh, this is a quite a lengthy five page handout. And you'll be able to follow along starting with this section on pollinators. Um, what I've done is I've listed plants that are associated with these different animals. And these uh, will take the references will take you their links that will take you to the fact sheets that she referred to the tried and true fact sheets, you'll get much more information on those fact sheets about uh, how to go about growing these plants. So let's begin with a, a quick look at uh, our pollinators. The very first pollinators were the beetles and we have uh, fossil evidence of them and their uh, pollination of cycads about 200 million years ago in the Mesozoic era. era. They're our largest group of pollinators, uh, pollinating 88% of plants worldwide. Now, this is uh, their most prevalent in tropical areas. So for our purposes, they're important uh, as pollinators of ancient species, such as magnolias and spicebush. Beetles rely mainly on their sense of smell. So they're going to be drawn to flowers with either a spicy, a fruity, or a fetid fragrance. They feed on both the nectar and pollen, but unfortunately they can be rather destructive, eating their way through the petals and the reproductive flower parts. This means that they'll be less effective because they may be remaining for quite some time on one individual flower. But they are also beneficial in our gardens as predators of aphids. Beetles prefer open, white, cream, or green colored flowers, some good examples in our region are sweet bay magnolia, magnolia virginiana, sweet shrub, calicanthus floridus, and jack in the pulpit, arisema trifilum. These are our absolute best pollinators for several reasons. First of all, they have a purposeful collection of pollen and they also have fuzzy bodies that will hold the pollen as they move between the flowers. There are 400 native species of bees in Maryland and Virginia. Just a brief reminder, honeybees are not native. They were introduced to this country uh, from Europe in the 1600s. Now, some of our native bees, uh, the bumblebees, uh, are social bees. That means that they will have annual colonies. There'll be a queen bumblebee and she will produce offspring, daughters that will be workers, then eventually male bees. And uh, they will remain together in this colony, successive generations over the entire growing season. But most of our bees are actually solitary. That means that a single female will be responsible for all of the tasks of seeking out and provisioning a nest and laying eggs and caring for the young. So th those bees, uh, our native bees, 70% of them nest underground and 30% of them nest in cavities. But without a colony to defend, these solitary bees are going to rely much less on stinging. There are many sizes, body types, and tank tongue lengths of bees. You see just a a very small sampling here, sweat bee, masked bee, and leaf cutter bee. And among the larger bees are the carpenter bee and the bumblebee. Bees, as I mentioned at the outset, use both nectar and pollen. The uh, female adults are using these products 
for energy and nutrition, and they will combine nectar and pollen together into what's referred to as bee bread, which will be the food for the offspring. Bees can release pollen in several ways. They can either use appendages on their legs or their mouth parts for combing, or they can also use what's referred to as buzz pollination or sonication. And there's a great example of that in the large photo on the right. Uh, that particular plant is pink turtle head, Chelone leonii, and you see a bumblebee just starting to enter that flower. Some of the flowers, uh, hold their pollen very tightly, and it's necessary for the bees to actually enter the flower and vibrate it very rapidly to uh, release the pollen. Female bees uh, have different ways of collecting the pollen. The sweat bee that you see up at the top has pollen collecting hairs referred to as scopa. And bumblebees, you see the bumblebee in the large photo and the inset there, have pollen baskets referred to as corbiculae. They are the, the orange structures you see on their tibia. And the leaf cutter bee at the bottom actually collects pollen on her abdomen. Bees tend to prefer blue or purple, purple tubular flowers. A good example is Anis hyssop. Agastache funiculum. And secondarily, they will go to yellow and white flowers. Examples of those might be rough stemmed goldenrod, Solidago rugosa, and nodding onion, Allium cernuum. Most female bees collect pollen from many genera of plants, but about 25 to 30 percent of bees are referred to as pollen specialists. Uh, the technical term for that is oligolectic, and they are collecting from fewer species, maybe one or two genera, or maybe even down to just one or two uh, individual species. And one example is the ragwort bee that uh, collects the pollen specifically of golden ragwort. These bees will use olfactory cues to help find their host plants. And this uh, method of seeking pollen can be very efficient, but in these days of climate change, it can be somewhat problematic. There can be a mismatch in the emergence of the bee and the needed flowers. Many plants will rely on increasing day length uh, in the spring as their cue for when to uh, produce flowers. And bees, on the other hand, may rely on warming temperatures as their cue for emergence. So there could be a, a mismatch in synchronization. Uh, in addition to using the floral resources, bees use other plant parts. Leaf cutter bees use leaf pieces to help construct their nests. They will fly and cut out the semicircular uh, sections of leaves and then carry them to a nesting area. They'll find a cavity and roll the leaves in almost a, a cigar-like formation with the eggs and the uh, pollen provided inside. Other bees, such as carpenter bees, bore holes in the pithy plant stems. And some examples of the stems they might use are the joe pie weeds, elderberry, and the sumacs. Moving on to our next pollinator, the flies are the second most efficient pollinators, and they're responsible for pollinating many of our fruits and vegetables, as well as cocoa plants. The so-called flower flies, the surfid flies, resemble bees, but have only one set of wings. The adults feed on nectar and or pollen, and their young help control aphids. Flies prefer dark brown, purple, or pale flowers, and some local examples are red trillium, trillium erectum, pawpaw, Asimina triloba, and common wild ginger, Acerum canadense. Wasps are the evolutionary ancestors of bees, but they're less efficient because they're not fuzzy and they don't have those special pollen collecting structures. Uh, the adults will visit the flowers for nectar and pollen for energy, but they are predatory and they will be feeding young 
uh, other insects or spiders, or as parasitoids, they will lay their eggs on other uh, insects and the, uh, the young will feed on those insects. Most of the insect stings that we humans uh, experience are actually caused by social wasps and not bees. And solitary wasps are beneficial and not aggressive. Wasps also play an important role in controlling the insects that damage plants, uh, such as uh, cabbage loopers, uh, marmorated stink bugs, for example. Wasps prefer white or yellow flowers with shallow corollas. Some examples are common bone set, Eupatorium perfoliatum, virgin's bower, Clematis virginiana, rattlesnake master, Eryngium yesifolium. Now we move on to the butterflies. Uh, many people consider these, in a sense, the, the gateway pollinators, the ones that attract uh, the most attention to, to the uh, importance and, and now the, the concern about the dwindling populations of pollinators. There are 102 species uh, native to Virginia, 150 in Maryland. And butterflies are also subdivided into two other groups, uh, the skippers that have stouter bodies and that uh, have quick darting uh, flight habits. And the fritillaries, these uh, types of butterflies have shorter front legs minus the little claws that the others have. And they are generally characterized by these uh, orange and black uh, checkered patterns on their wings. All of these types of butterflies will seek nectar with their long uh, tube-like tongues. Uh, the technical term is proboscis. And you see a great example of that here. Uh, when resting, the tongue will actually be curled up almost like a garden hose. And then the butterflies will extend it uh, in order to feed. Now, although they are the poster children, of pollinators, butterflies are really only the primary pollinators for about 8% of plants. And that is for several reasons. They lack the specialized structures for collecting pollen. And because they're standing high up on the plant, uh, raised up with their long thin legs, they have relatively little contact with flowers. Uh, the larger butterflies may collect some pollen on their wings and the uh, smaller ones may get a bit of pollen on the head or proboscis as they're feeding. Butterflies prefer flat composite flowers in bright colors. Some great examples are purple coneflower, Echinacea purpurea, blue mist flower, Coniclinium cholestinum, and coastal plain joe pieweed, Eutrochium dubium. Now there's an important point to make uh, regarding butterflies and their close relationship with plants. The adults, both the males and the females, will use the nectar of plants as flight fuel. But there have been special relationships evolved over a long period of time with certain plant species in order to support their young. As you may recall, uh, butterflies go through four stages of metamorphosis. The females will lay eggs on the undersides of leaves. And then the caterpillars, the larvae, will feed on the foliage of those leaves as they proceed between molts through four to six stages that are referred to as instars. Then uh, the chrysalis stage will continue. And finally, the new butterfly will emerge. There can be one to multiple generations of butterflies per season, depending on the species. Now, you may be concerned when you think about this uh, larval host relationship, uh, the feeding, because we tend to associate feeding the damage uh, on plants to the foliage uh, with pests. But this feeding is in ecological balance. It's evolved over a long period of time. and. Uh, Doug Tellamy, the entomologist, urges us to use what he refers to as the 10-foot rule. If you really step away from the plants, you're not going to see a significant amount of, of damage. And um, in a sense, seeing the use of the plants is a sign of life in our gardens. Uh, here's just a few examples of larval host plants. 
Now, the adults, as I mentioned, are going to nectar on many different plants. You'll see them, for example, on uh, monardas, on phlox, and asters throughout the growing season. But the young, the caterpillars, are going to rely on milkweeds. And three good examples that are local to our area are common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca. This is a more uh, coarse, robust, very robust plant. Uh, swamp milkweed, Asclepias incarnata, that grows in moisture areas. And the shorter butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa, that uh, grows in sunny, dry areas. Uh, some other examples of host plants, these for swallow tails. Tulip poplar tree, the Liriodendron tulipifera, is the host to the eastern tiger swallowtail, our Virginia state butterfly. Spicebush, Lindera benzoin, is the host to the spicebush swallowtail. And golden alexanders, Zizia aurea, is the host to the black swallowtail. Now you may also see the caterpillars of this uh, particular butterfly on other garden plants in that carrot family. These examples could be uh, fennel, dill, or parsley. Just a few other of the many, many examples. Uh, plant and leaf pussy toes, Antonaria plantaginifolia, will host the painted lady butterfly. And white turtlehead, Chelone glabra, hosts the Baltimore checker spot, which is Maryland's state butterfly. Skippers use grasses as host plants. Some examples of our native grasses are little blue stem, Schizocarium scoparium, switchgrass, Panicum virgatum, and Indian grass, Sorgastrum newtons. Fritillaries, on the other hand, will use violets of all types as their host plants. Moths are the other type of uh, insect in the order Lepidoptera. They are actually more abundant than butterfly species. There are 509 species native to Virginia and 489 found in Maryland. They vary greatly in size from a, a wingspan of less to an inch to a wingspan of three to four inches. The tulip tree silk moth you see there is one of the larger ones. Uh, some of them are active by day, that's how I got the, uh, the two other photos, but mostly they are nocturnal. So they will prefer flowers that are opening either during the late afternoon or on into the evening. As with butterflies, they have a long proboscis to excess uh, nectar and some pollen will collect on their bodies. Moths prefer pale or white night scented tubular flowers. Garden phlox, Phlox paniculata, evening primrose, Onothera biennis, and common yucca, yucca filamentosa, are three examples. Moths also need larval host plants. They go through stages of metamorphosis. So you'll see their caterpillars, rather than the chrysalis stage, they will actually form a cocoon before going on to emerge as adults. Just a few examples of larval host plants for moths are river birch, Betula nigra, arrowwood viburnum, viburnum dentatum, and Virginia creeper, Parthenocissus quinquefolia. And one other type of animal, not an insect, that can become involved in pollination is the hummingbird. Hummingbirds uh, feed on nectar of plants while they're hovering, and some pollen will land on their heads, as you see in that central photo. Hummingbirds will also be involved uh, with other uh, pollinators. They'll eat the soft-bodied insects, such as the caterpillars of butterflies and moths. Hummingbirds prefer bright colored tubular flowers. Some good examples are trumpet creeper, Campsis radicans, spotted jewelweed, Impatiens capensis, and scarlet bee balm, Monarda didyma. Let's move on to native plants that support pollinators. And uh, this will be uh, taking up a good part of the handout. You'll see the plants, they are arranged in bloom order. 
and uh, you'll see the, the links that will take you pretty much to our tried and true fact sheets. There are a few examples of plants for which we don't have our own fact sheets, and I'm linking to some very helpful information from North Carolina State Extension. Okay, native plants that support pollinators. Uh, before we get to the specific species, I wanted to talk a little bit generally about uh, how flower shapes can affect the visitation. The, it'll affect the particular insects that you might be looking to see. Uh, the first type of plants are the composite plants. These consist of the showy ray flowers and the central disc flowers. Uh, these are going to have the most floral visitors of all the types. And they are especially attractive to the butterflies because they're going to have a, a large platform for them to, to land on. They stand rather than hovering, of course. Uh, this particular example is uh, the New, New York aster. There are some flowers referred to as umbelliferous. This is a term that simply means it's a cluster of small flowers all together, many flowers. And this type of, of plant will be frequented by flies and short-tongued bees. And the particular example I'm showing here is elderberry. There are tubular flowers and uh, the lips, the lower lips of these flowers are handy landing platforms for bees. They will actually have to insert their bodies into the flowers and uh, it will sometimes rely on stronger bees like the uh, the bumblebees in order to pry apart the lips. This particular plant shown here is a great blue lobelia. Some flowers are nodding, uh, particularly the, uh, the spring ephemerals. They will be by that lower position attractive to the insects that are starting to emerge and flying low along the ground. Of course, because they're nodding, this uh, poses a, a little bit of a challenge to pollinators. They'll either have to hang upside down or some of the smaller bees can actually crawl inside. And the final type of flower are complex flowers like the Eastern uh, wild columbine that's shown here. These will rely on access by long tongued bees. Although there are some pollinators referred to as nectar robbers that will actually chew into the, the back of these spurs to access the nectar more easily. Plants will also use different types of floral attractants to draw the pollinators in. Uh, nectar guides will direct the insect visitors. Some good examples are the white central area of downy phlox, the dark venation on Virginia blue flag, and the dark pink nectar guides on spring beauty. Now, some plants, we won't actually be able to perceive those nectar guides, but bees, uh, which view the plants in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum can see this very easily. An example is marsh marigold. And finally, plants can use bold contrasting colors to attract pollinators. Some examples are New England aster and aromatic aster. So let's begin moving through the seasons We'll be talking about native plants, the plants that have evolved specifically with our native pollinators. And uh, we'll start with the early spring ephemerals. These will be emerging before the canopy of the forest has really opened up. The, the sunlight is actually reaching down to the ground floor. And because it's so early, uh, you won't be seeing butterflies, moths, or hummingbirds at this stage. One of the first uh, flowers to open are those of bloodroot, Sanguinaria canadensis. This is a nectarless plant, but uh, small bees will be attracted to the pollinator, uh, to, the, to the pollen, excuse me. They'll be coming uh, quite often in the afternoon when the temperatures have warmed up. If for some reason uh, pollinators don't arrive, these flowers can close up and self-pollinate. Another wonderful early spring ephemeral is spring beauty, Claytonia virginica. This is visited by many bees, but there's a specialist bee that will use the pollen. 
The flowers of Dutchman's breeches, Dicentro cucularia, are timed specifically to open up uh, along with the emergence of queen bumblebees. They will have been hibernating over the winter. They will be very hungry, seeking uh, nectar. And so this is a, a very important early nectar source. Again, the, uh, the nectar robbers may bite through the, the backside of those little pantaloons. Uh, it's important to note that not just our flowering herbaceous plants, but woody plants can be very supportive of the pollinators. And this is true of the early spring trees. Red maple, Acer rubrum, is either a dioecious tree with flowers on separate male or female trees, or the flowers may be separated on different branches. So this plant is going to rely on insect pollination, and it's a very important early nectar source. Uh, this plant is also a larval host to moths, such as the imperial moth. Downy service berry, Amelanchier arborea, a, a beautiful understory tree, is excellent for native bees and beneficial surfid flies. And it's the larval host for several uh, butterflies, uh, the viceroy and the striped hair streak. Eastern red bud, Cercus canadensis, is uh, very attractive for. Uh, early medium sized bees. They will be strong enough to, to pry apart those lips. Uh, it is the host for several butterflies and moths, including the Henry's Elfin. And uh, the leaves of Eastern Redbud are uh, often used by leaf cutter bees to line their nests. Continuing with some later spring trees, if you already have a, a white oak, Quercus alba in your yard, you are providing uh, incredible wildlife support. Doug Tallamy ranks this as the top keystone woody plant. And this is because it supports 534 different species of Lepidoptera. They include the imperial moth, hair streaks, dusky wings. And if you uh, don't have room for this large uh, an oak, you might consider planting the dwarf chinkapin that grows only 12 to 25 feet, but will still provide wonderful support for the Lepidoptera. Another great native tree is river birch, Betula nigra. This is a larval host to 413 species, including the morning cloak and the dreamy dusky wing. Again, if you don't have room for the large uh, straight species, you might consider Little King, a petite cultivar of only about 10 feet. Should you have a smaller yard, you might want to look at American Hornbeam, Carpinus Caroliniana, an excellent small shade tree, especially climate adaptable, uh, wonderful for urban landscapes. It reaches about 25 feet in height. This is a great nectar source as well as a larval host plant. It hosts the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, the Striped Hair Streak, and the Red Spotted Purple. The River Birch, of course, has wonderful exfoliating bark, and American Hornbeam has very interesting uh, muscular texture to its bark. Moving on to mid-spring wildflowers, wild geranium, geranium maculatum, uh, is visited by many pollinators, bees, flies, and butterflies. And among the uh, herbaceous plants, it's one of the most important larval hosts, uh, hosting 23 different species. It's also um, important for the specialist mining bee. Woodland phlox, phlox de pericata, is a, a delicate plant, but it can actually uh, enjoy visits from uh, fairly large butterflies as well as uh, humming bees, uh, hummingbirds. It is the larval host for hair streaks and swallowtails. Wild bleeding heart, Dicentra eczemia, uh, offers nectar for long tongue bees and hummingbirds. Later spring blooms include the violets that I've mentioned. They, uh, of course, are the larval host for the fritillaries, and they also support a specialist bee. Blue wild indigo, Baptisia australis, 
attracts uh, bumblebees in particular uh, because of that dark purple color and the tubular shape of the flower. And it's a larval host for many butterflies, including the orange sulfur, the clouded sulfur, the frosted elfin, and the wild indigo dusky wing. Beard tongue, Penstemon digitalis, is a prolific a producer of nectar. It's visited particularly by small and medium-sized bees that can fit inside those tubular flowers. Uh, it also uh, invites a specialist bee and wasp. This plant is important because it will tide uh, the pollinators over between uh, spring and summer resources. Moving on to some more woody plants, some spring blooming shrubs, Black chokeberry, Aronia melanocarpa, uh, invites large and small bees. They will be attracted by those bright pink anthers. And it's the larval host for 29 species of um, butterflies, including the coral hair streak and the bluish spring moth. Pinkster bloom azalea, Rhododendron periclimenoides, attracts bees, butterflies, and hummers to its slightly fragrant flowers. Black haw, Viburnum pernifolium, is the tallest of our native viburnums, and it serves many pollinators, uh, myriad small bees, flies, and lepidoptera, and it's the host to moths, including the hummingbird clearwing. Some summer blooming shrubs include wild hydrangea, hydrangea arborescens. This offers nectar and pollen to bees, wasps, and surfid flies, and is the larval host for the hydrangea sphinx and leaf tear moths. New Jersey tea, Ceanothus americanus, again serves many pollinators. Uh, butterflies, wasps, flies, beetles, and bees, and it hosts moths and skippers. Um, it's also uh, important as a, a pollen a provider for adrena bees. Button bush, Cephalanthus occidentalis, uh, offers nectar and pollen to bees, butterflies, and hummers, and is also a larval host for moths such as the hydrangea and titan sphinxes and the beautiful woods nymph. Continuing with our summer blooming shrubs, sweet pepper bush, Clethra alnifolia, has scented flowers that are especially attractive to butterflies and native bees, and it's a larval host for 11 species of Lepidoptera. Shrubby St. John's wort, Hypericum prolificum, is nectarless, but it does offer abundant pollen. Uh, and it is the host for the gray hair streak butterfly and a variety of moths. And finally, one other woody plant, this time a vine, trumpet honeysuckle, Lonicera semper virens. This is especially attractive to hummingbirds, but it will also provide nectar for bees and butterflies. And it's the host to the spring azure butterfly and the snowberry clear wing moth. Moving on to midsummer uh, herbaceous plants, wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa, attracts butterflies and bees. And it's one of the best forage plants for bumblebees because it provides a continuous uh, nectar reward throughout the day. It also hosts uh, several moths. Purple coneflower, Echinacea purpurea, attracts many beneficial insects. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit later about the importance of choosing the straight species of this plant. Uh, it attracts both short and long tongue bees and many types of butterflies, and beetles are also common visitors. Coastal plain joe pie weed, Eutrochium dubium, attracts many pollinators, and its large flowers um, are exceptional visual attractants, and the, the, the dome shape of them it forms the perfect landing pad for the butterflies. I'll be talking a little bit later about how the stems of this plant can help create 
important winter habitat. Some more midsummer blooms, great blue lobelia, lobelia syphilitica, attracts long-tongued bees and sometimes butterflies as shown here. Uh, the primary pollinators are bumblebees. They're the most frequent visitor. We've uh, mentioned swamp milkweed, Asclepius incarnata, as a nectar plant for monarchs as well uh, as a host plant for their caterpillars, but numerous other beneficial insects will visit this plant. One uh, interesting thing to note about the milkweeds as a group, their pollen is not released easily, but it is not released by buzz pollination. Uh, it, this, these, uh, this category of plant actually forms what are referred to as pollinia. These are uh, sticky sacks of pollen. And when insects that land on the flowers stick their feet into the flowers, the uh, poll pollinia will attach as you see here, and they will be drawn out and then carried on to another flower. Blazing star, Liatra spicata, is a great nectar source for bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. It won't uh, provide uh, a larval host of services, for the, for the monarchs, but uh, it, it is a great nectar source. Uh, it is a host plant for flower moths. Interestingly, it blooms from the top down. More midsummer blooms. Oxi, Heliopsis helianthoides, uh, has many pollinators over its long uh, bloom period. Turk's cap lilia, Lilium superbum, uh, has quite dramatic flowers, about four or five inches across. It uh, tends to attract the larger pollinators, uh, butterflies, large insects, as well as hummingbirds. Orange cone flower, Rudbeckia fulgida, is one of several species of Rudbeckias. Uh, it will draw butterflies and other pollinators, and it has a long bloom period from July into October. Now some late summer blooms. Threadleaf coreopsis, coreopsis verticillata, actually will begin blooming in June, but it continues on well through the summer and attracts many pollinators. Short tooth mountain mint, Pycnanthema muticum, uh, showed up as a very important plant in pollinator trials that were conducted by Penn State Extension a number of years ago. This plant was ranked number one for the wide variety of pollinators and also number one for the total number of pollinators. Uh, white flowers don't generally attract bees, as I mentioned, but because of those purple spots, they, they will be attracted to this plant. Uh, it's a very attractive in the warm summer months with that cool uh, sensation of the, the silvery bracts bordering those white flowers. Another great plant for late summer is New York ironweed, Vernonia noveboracensis. This supports bees and butterflies and also hosts the painted lady butterfly. Now I'd like to talk about three uh, important categories of fall blooming flowers. They're going to offer pollen, but especially late nectar sources. Uh, these are critical for the last generation of the new queen bumblebees that are going to be hatching late in the season. They are going to need to feed uh, voraciously on these plants to stock up uh, lipids, uh, fatty stores and energy in their bodies in order to tide them over the long winter months of hibernation. So uh, these three categories begin with the goldenrods. Doug Tallamy in his study of, of plants has determined that the goldenrods as a group are the number one keystone genus of the herbaceous plants. They host 115 species of butterflies and moths. Now, before I talk about the three species shown here, I wanted to uh, clarify something. Goldenrod does not cause fall allergies. It's actually ragweed, which has inconspicuous flowers, but copious loose pollen. 
This plant is wind pollinated, whereas the golden rods all have very sticky pollen, they're going to rely on the insect pollinators to carry it between flowers. So uh, a good reason now to consider the golden rods uh, as a plant you might want to add to your garden. Uh, the first of the examples I show here is blue stemmed golden rod, Solidago caesia. This is a graceful plant and I consider it a little uh, more well behaved than some of the other uh, more aggressive species. It grows in sun to part shade and dry to moist soil. Another example is rough stemmed golden rod, Solidago rugosa. The fireworks cultivar is shown here. It has a characteristic zigzag pattern to the stems. It'll grow in sun and moist to wet soil. Gray goldenrod, Solidago nemoralis, has wand-like panicles of flowers and is a tough and very adaptable plant. The second uh, genus of flowers that's so important for our late season pollinators are the asters. This is the number two keystone genus hosting 112 Lepidoptera. Uh, an excellent example is aromatic aster, Symphiotrichum oblongifolium. It has a very long bloom period. Uh, it will continue on even into November, and it has a more shrub-like habit that uh, is, is very attractive in gardens. New England aster, Symphiotrichum novae angliae, has profuse bloom in the sun. This tends to be uh, a more straggly, leggy plant, but uh, if there are questions about how to do this, I can discuss how you might uh, cut it back to control the height uh, to reduce the need for staking. Blue wood aster, Symphiotrichum cordifolium, uh, is a delicate woodland species that will grow in dry shade. And finally, the sunflowers are the number three keystone species hosting 73 Lepidoptera. The example I'm showing here is woodland sunflower, Helianthus divericatus. It supports many pollinators growing in part shade and dry soil. And finally, a few other late season plants, uh, hairy alum root, Heuchera velosa. Here I'm showing the autumn bride cultivar. It's especially a drought tolerant. It has a very long bloom period and the leaves uh, are evergreen through winter. It attracts uh, a good variety of our pollinators, native bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Spotted bee balm is a, a fairly new discovery I've made, uh, Monarda punctata. It attracts many be beneficial insects and hummingbirds. And I would like to conclude this section on plants to mention two plants to avoid. The first is butterfly bush. And I realize that it is quite a popular plant with many gardeners. This plant, unfortunately, is not native here. It's native to China. And the problem is that rather than just staying in a well-behaved manner uh, in our gardens, seeds from this plant can be carried some distance away and it invades our natural areas. Uh, it is on the invasive plant list for both Arlington and Alexandria uh, in Virginia and many other states consider it an invasive plant. Some folks feel that they might be on the safe side by using what are referred to as sterile cultivars. But unfortunately, the accurate term for these is actually reduced fertility cultivars. Even if the fertility is reduced to 2%, these plants can still produce over a growing season 60,000 viable seeds, which can easily be widely dispersed via the wind and then they can interbreed with, with other um, non-sterile plants that have already invaded our natural areas and just spread even further. But the other important reason to uh, think of other plants, uh, native plants rather than butterfly bush, is that this plant only provides nectar. It is not going to serve as a host plant for our caterpillars. It's not going to support the full life cycle of butterflies. And on your handout, I've provided a link 
to a fact sheet that I've created. In fact, I've created a whole set of fact sheets in addition to the tried and true fact sheets. Our Master Gardener website has a set of fact sheets on locally invasive native plant, uh, in, uh, locally in invasive plants. And uh, this will, fact sheet will describe some of the problems with butterfly bush and list many suggestive uh, native alternatives. Another popular plant to avoid is tropical milkweed. This plant is native to South America, and unfortunately, it is the milkweed species that's the most widely available commercially. There are several problems with this plant. Uh, first, uh, many growers are using a systemic insecticide, and that's going to, to render it uh, unusable as a, a host plant. Uh, monarchs will also be confused if they see it in our area. They will be confused into breeding and not completing their migration uh, south to Mexico. Uh, there is also a damaging parasite referred to by the abbreviation OE that uh, becomes prevalent when this plant is grown as a perennial and dangerous levels of, of this pathogen can be passed on to the larvae. So it's not going to provide uh, proper support for our monarchs. Uh, I've got uh, on your handout a link to uh, an article by the Xerxes Society that goes into more detail on this. So I recommend that instead of growing this species, you look to our local natives. Uh, we've already discussed three of them, common milkweed, swamp milkweed, and butterfly weed. And uh, the others listed here, purple milkweed, world milkweed, clasping milkweed, and green milkweed are also good choices. Uh, do we have any questions at this point, Betsy? Yes, we have a few. Uh, there was a question, can trumpet vine grow on the edge of woods? It's, I find it too aggressive in my garden. Uh, yes, in fact, you'll often see it uh, on uh, at the edge of, of woodlands. It, it will need the sun to bloom, but, uh, but that it will maybe even grow up somewhat into the trees. You're correct. This is a more aggressive plant. So you would want to think about ways to control its growth. You could do that by planting it in a container, maybe at, at the base uh, of an arbor or a column that you would like it to wind around, or you could uh, put some kind of barriers deep uh, in the soil surrounding it to control its spread, not allow the, the roots to move out beyond where, where you've intended it to grow. And then someone wanted to know, will any spring ephemerals grow in the sun? Well, the spring ephemerals are, are really basically woodland species. Right. They do need the sunlight, but it's that, that sunlight, that early, uh, less powerful spring sunlight that they're going to be getting filtered down through the forest. Um, some of the species that I listed as woodland plants, not the ephemerals, for example, uh, the geranium maculatum, the wild geranium, can, can grow actually in, in a certain amount of sun. You'd want to provide more water for that plant. The the helpful thing about the fact sheets is that they're going to provide, if you follow the links, uh, they're going to provide a lot more information on the spe specific growing conditions for all of the plants. Obviously today, I can't give you the full profile for each of the plants, but uh, a number of them can grow in slightly sunnier conditions. Someone asked if um, Coreopsis will bloom longer if deadheaded. Yes, you can do several things. You can either pinch back or snip the individual flowers, or maybe part way into the season, you can actually use your shears, uh, cut them down a, a little bit lower, and there will be a regrowth and a continuation of the bloom. So that's true of, of many of these flowers that you can, can encourage uh, rebloom. Uh, the one plant that you might not want to cut back would be uh, echinacea, the, um, the purple coneflower, because those um, central sea, uh, cones 
are going to turn into seed heads that will, will be very, very beneficial for goldfinches. Okay, and then people are interested in more types of pollinators that you may not have mentioned, which you can get into in addition to the previously mentioned question about mosquitoes, people are wondering about bats in our region, so. Uh, bats uh, are important pollinators. They're really going to be much more active. Uh, I, I know in desert areas, there are some bats, <coughs> excuse me, and in tropical areas, uh, but they are not really going to be um, playing a role as pollinators in our particular region. All right. We'll move on to consider some best gardening practices for pollinators. First of all, as we've mentioned, it's important to remove if you have them or to avoid buying invasive plants. Uh, they're going to spread ramp rampantly beyond our individual gardens because of this, the seeds or fruit. The seeds uh, can be can be uh, carried through the wind and fruit will be carried by birds well beyond our gardens. Uh, unfortunately, invasive plants suppress and they outcompete native species when they're carried into our natural areas. And they quite often have the advantage of blooming earlier. So they get well established before the native species can emerge. And all of these factors mean that they are going to displace native plants which provide critical nectar and pollen for our native pollinators. We've uh, talked about the importance of using native plants. They have involved, evolved over a long period of time with our local fauna. So they're going to provide the perfect nectar, pollen, and uh, will serve as host plants, especially for the Lepidoptera. Uh, it's important to use plants with various flower types, as I mentioned at the beginning of the discussion about the plants, uh, the tubular flowers, the those with the with the flat umbels, those clusters, the uh, the composite flowers shown with the uh, bee on the side there that have both the ray and the central disc flowers. Each of these types is going to attract different pollinators. And you want to be sure to include both herbaceous and woody plants if you have the room for it. So that would include uh, trees, shrubs, and vines. It's important to provide bloom for the entire growing season. And it's recommended, if at all possible, to aim to have three different species of flowers blooming at any given time in the season. Uh, this will address the question on cultivars. We highly recommend choosing the straight species, that is the natural form of native species, over cultivars. Those are plant varieties that are produced in cultivation through selective breeding. The reason for this is that breeding is really undertaken pretty much for human enjoyment and convenience. There will be modifications to the size of a plant, uh, to its uh, drought tolerance, its <clears throat> disease resistance, but most often the changes are made uh, for aesthetic reasons. Uh, horticulturists believe that flowers of different colors, different shapes are going to be more attractive to us. The problem is that they are not bred with, particularly with uh, our pollinators in mind. Some smaller cultivars may be acceptable. Um, if you have a smaller garden, you, you may just not be able to fit some of the larger shrubs or trees, for example. The problems occur uh, when there are changes to the foliage and the flowers. If there is a change of the leaf color of shrubs, that means that there's a, a modification of the chemistry and it will no longer be able to be used as a host plant. Uh, the example here is arrowwood viburnum. The leaves of the straight species uh, are filled with green chlorophyll. In this red feather cultivar, anthocyanins uh, replace the chlorophyll to give it its lovely uh, maroon color, but uh, it will not be recognized and nutritious as a host plant for Lepidoptera. Other problems occur in the herbaceous plants when there are modifications to the color and especially the shape of flowers. 
here with our wild hydrangea, you can very easily see all the reproductive flower parts. This Annabelle cultivar is absolutely beautiful, but it's essentially a large ball of sterile flowers. It doesn't have any of the, uh, the fertile flowers with the, the anthers and the stamens and pistils and styles. Uh, purple coneflower is probably the plant that is the most modified of any plant in the horticulture tray. Here you want to stick with the straight species. It will have the mauve colored ray flowers and this very prominent central cone. That's important because that's the source of the nectar and the pollen. When that central cone is replaced by extra petals, as in this double delight cultivar, again, this is a sterile flower. It's not going to offer anything for our pollinators. Another good practice for pollinators is to plant in a sunny open location. Uh, many of the pollinators need sun to warm their flight muscles or to dry the, the dew off of their wings in the morning but they will seek refuge of shade on hot afternoons. And as we've mentioned, there are some plants that, that grow in the shade and they will certainly visit those plants there. If at all possible, it's a good idea to plant in masses and drifts, ideally a, a mass of about three by th uh, three feet. This makes the plants very easy to spot as the pollinators are flying in. And it also facilitates efficient foraging. They can move from flower to flower in a very small area rather than using so much energy reaching between plants that are widely separated by mulch. Uh, here are some techniques for creating habitat for bees. It's a good idea, if you can, to retain some open spots for our ground nesting native bees. As you'll recall, 70% of them are ground dwelling bees. Uh, sunny slopes with loose soil are preferred. And here's a look at what those underground tunnels of the solitary bees would look like with their brood chambers. The eggs are laid with uh, balls of pollen and nectar. You can also create habitat for bees by retaining wide stems of perennials. You'll do that by choosing plants that have a circumference, pencil size or larger. A good example is uh, this one shown here, the Joe Pie Weed. You'll keep this plant up through the rest of the season. It will provide lovely winter interest. And then in the spring, you will cut back those tall stalks to anywhere between uh, 12 to 24 inches. Over the course of the growing season, the uh, solitary bees, the native bees, will find these and uh, the, the cavity nesting bees will create these little brood cells for their young. Then, oops, I'm sorry, the, uh, the new growth will, uh, it will come up and cover over these naked stems. They will still be uh, harboring the, uh, the hibernating young bees over, over the winter, and then they will emerge as shown here in the next spring. Now, there, uh, many of us are eager to provide support for, uh, for our bees, and we're thinking about adding bee hotels to our gardens. Uh, there have been some words of warning on this provided by our Arlington County naturalist, Alonso Abugadas. He's pointed out that grouping of bees all together uh, will actually attract more predators. Examples would be wasps, mice, and birds, uh, or parasites like the cuckoo bees. These are uh, bees that will actually wait until another species of native bee has uh, created her nest, and then she will go in and replace uh, the larvae with her own larvae, which will then feed on the pollen balls. Uh, fungus and parasites can be an issue when the tubes are all grouped together like this. Uh, it's important to keep uh, bee hotels clean. Uh, he advises that if you decide to try using them, that you make sure they're fastened very securely uh, above three feet over the ground, place them uh, 
for morning sun exposure and make sure that you're siting them where there's going to be mud that will be used to seal up the, the tubes and native pl plants nearby, of course, as uh, pollen and nectar sources. And you might also want to cover uh, with some screen across the front to, to prevent birds from reaching in. Another excellent practice for pollinators is to retain fall leaves as well as snags. Those are uh, dead trees and logs. These can be either overwintering sites for insect larvae or nesting sites for bees. You can also create habitat for butterflies by providing containers with landing spots and a shallow source of water and puddling areas for salts and minerals. It's uh, very critical, of course, to avoid pesticides. You can do this first by buying from a reputable nursery that doesn't use systemic insecticides such as the uh, neonicotinoids. Uh, and also, if you possibly can, avoid uh, using these chemicals to control insect pests, including mosquito spray in your own gardens. Use of these chemicals uh, is very harmful to the pollinators if it doesn't kill them outright. Uh, they are uh, equally affected. It's not just the, the insects, the, the pests that you're hoping to target that will be affected. Uh, the, the pollinators uh, will have uh, disrupted sleep patterns, reduced daytime foraging, it uh, will disrupt their homing systems and also make them more susceptible to parasites. The American bumblebee, for example, its population has plummeted by 89% over the past 20 years, largely due to the use of these chemicals. And some recent studies have shown that the pesticides even impair baby bee brain development. We have a number of very helpful articles on our Master Gardener website. Uh, that explain how you can control uh, mosquitoes without uh, having an impact on pollinators. Uh, I'd like to include a few garden plans for you uh, should you want to actually create some separate pollinator gardens. And the, the second of the handouts is a PDF that includes all of these color slides. So you'll be able to enlarge those images and, and see very carefully uh, exactly the plants that I'm describing. Um, the first garden is one that I was asked to create uh, for our small space garden at Fairlington Community Center. This is only 18 inches wide, about 20 feet long. And the idea here is that you could use all of these plants or maybe just uh, some selected uh, parts of them. So the ones that are shown here, uh, beginning up at the top, uh, is trumpet honeysuckle. This is the threadleaf coreopsis. This is the Shenandoah cultivar of switchgrass, one of the shorter cultivars with a lovely uh, maroon color to the fall foliage. This is the uh, the penstemon, the, the beard tongue, good uh, summer into fall source, another coreopsis here. This is the Gina cultivar of, uh, of uh, garden flocks. And this is one that was shown to be very uh, helpful for pollinators, very attractive to them in pollinator trials conducted by Mount, Mount Cuba. This is the uh, shorter uh, butterfly weed. This is one of the cultivars of a uh, goldenrod, golden fleece. This uh, is Monarda fistulosa, wild bergamot. And this is a shorter cultivar of um, ironweed, iron butterfly. And then three plants that were not included on the original uh, design are these uh, uh, ground cover plants, robin's plantain, wild pink, and pussy toes that help uh, interweave as a ground layer at the foot of each of the taller plants. And this plan is also accessible on our website. Uh, another of the garden plants I've included in your PDF is this uh, 
pollinator garden that some interns from the class of 2018 created at our Car Glen Carlin demonstration garden. It includes uh, a bed eight feet wide and 12 feet long, and it has a trellis at the back for some native vines and containers for plants that are more likely to spread. And when, when you look at the PDF, you'll be able to see the actual design, uh, photos of the plants that were included, and a very helpful chart that shows you the range of uh, bloom times as well as the bloom colors. And uh, this pollinator garden plan, uh, I've used in some of my talks before. It's part of the so-called Quick Start Guide on the Plant Nova Natives website. It's a design by uh, a local designer, Elisa Mira. And I wanted to point this out because she uses three different types of plants, the so-called um, structural plants. So she's actually using red chokeberry and Virginia sweet spire, uh, some small uh, shrub plants uh, to give architectural structure. Then she has what she would term the seasonal plants that are going to bloom over a period of time in the garden. So you'll have a common milkweed and sun drops in the spring, the shorter butterfly weed uh, going on into summer, as well as these two rudbeckias. Then in the fall, this is the gray uh, goldenrod that I described and another of the asters. She uses two grasses uh, on the left, Schizocarium scoparium, which is little blue stem, and on the right, uh, purple lovegrass, Aragrostis spectabilis. And then she fills in with several ground layer plants that are going to uh, prevent the need for mulching. They, in a sense, will act as, as green mulch. Uh, Pycnanthum tenuifolium is another of the, the mints. Uh, and then she uses the low spreading uh, native uh, <clears throat> strawberry and uh, blue eyed grass. And uh, even though this isn't for native uh, plants right here in our region, I've included this. Uh, from the Grow Native site, I believe it's for Missouri. I'm including it because there actually are some plants that are native to our area, but I wanted to show you how if you have a larger space, you could actually incorporate some fences to uh, involve uh, vertical growth of some vines in the middle of your bed. And you'll also note, uh, this very clearly shows the clusters of plants that I was describing, and they usually are odd numbers. Uh, garden designers usually indicate that multiples of three, five, and seven, for example, are the most attractive. So uh, when you look at this, you just want to make sure if the species are not locally native to, to uh, substitute some local natives from our fact sheets, and then make sure that you are using the, the correct soil moisture for each plant. And finally, for those of you who may not have room for these large uh, plants that I've included, I have a few tips on container gardening for pollinators. There are some special considerations when you use native plants. You're going to be using perennials instead of the summer blooming annuals that we usually associate with containers. So you're going to rely more on color and texture of foliage for visual interest because the plants will bloom over a shorter period of time. Of course, you'll want to match the plants carefully to growing conditions. So if you have a sunny balcony, choose plants that will grow well in the sun and the same for shade. It's recommended that you start with maybe one gallon nursery pots to get you off to a good growth for the growing season and use more compact cultivars where appropriate. But as we've discussed, retain the flower color and the shape of the native straight species. You can choose a wide variety of plants, as I'm showing here, perennials, ferns, grasses, sedges, and rushes, as well as even small shrubs. And what you'll do is to choose plants that are native to the prairies and the open fields for sunny locations and woodland natives that would grow in dappled shade if you have a, a shady patio or shady balcony. And of course, you'll want to group plants with the same cultural requirements if you're putting them together in a single container. And of course, as with any of the plants you'd put directly into the ground, 
buy from a reputable nursery that isn't going to use the systemic insecticides. One uh, popular way to combine plants in a single a planter is to use the familiar formula that you might have used with uh, the annuals. You could use, for example, as your thriller plant, uh, the taller orange cone flower. As a filler, you might uh, choose butterfly weed that's going to add more mass to that container. And then you could select a spiller plant like the recumbent snow flurry cultivar of heath aster that will actually spill over the edge of the container. These three plants would be a great combination for a sunny location. A few other plants for sun, you could use a blazing star in the center as your thriller, smooth blue aster as the filler plant that would be blooming more into the fall, and moss phlox uh, would be blooming in the spring as your spiller, but it's evergreen, so that would continue to be a presence at the basis, base of the other plants later in the season. Uh, here's an example of a planter from Mount Cuba. They're using, again, that switchgrass Shenandoah cultivar in the center. Uh, they've used the bluewood aster Avondale uh, for the filler plant, and the spiller is alum root. Here's a container from Mount Cuba for the shade. They've used either white or pink turtle head as the tall thriller plant, uh, American alum root as the filler, and the spiller is marginal wood fern, which is an evergreen fern. Should you want to create a wetland planter, some examples would be scarlet rose mallow as the thriller, blue flag as your filler plant, and soft rush as the spiller. This was a very attractive garden specifically for hummingbirds that I saw when I visited the Norfolk Botanical Garden. Now, uh, to my recollection, none of these were native plants, but you could use the same concept to create a hummingbird garden with native plants. On the trellis, you would use trumpet honeysuckle, and then in the containers, the plants that would be very attractive to them, Eastern Columbine in the spring, Scarlet bee balm, cardinal flower, Canada lily, and Indian pink. I'll conclude uh, giving you a little more information on the resources that are listed at the end of the lengthy handout. Uh, we've talked several times about the tried and true fact sheets. Uh, these are found on our mgnv.org website, but you will have the links that will take you directly from the handout to any of the plants you're interested in. So as you can see, they're going to give you a lot more information, all the, uh, the characteristics of the plant and the best way to grow it, as well as the importance of this particular plant for our pollinators. In addition, if you follow the links, you'll actually see many accompanying videos that have been created by my colleague, Mary Free. These are uh, wonderfully entertaining, just a few minutes long, but they'll actually show you the pollinators in action. If you want to go directly just to looking at videos of pollinators, we have an entire playlist of uh, pollinators on our MGNV YouTube channel. Uh, should you want to learn more about pollinators in general, I can highly recommend these books. And uh, one of the books here is authored by Heather Holm. It's the blue book here at the bottom. She is an absolutely spectacular presenter. And if you're lucky enough to see her uh, either in person or uh, virtually, she lives in the Midwest. So I've seen her in a number of webinars, including one just yesterday, hosted by Ginter Garden. She's a very authoritative, but uh, provides information in such an enjoyable and easily understandable way, accompanied by fantastic photographs. I'm sure you'll, you'll enjoy listening to her. And these are two uh, newly published books by Heather Holm, this one specifically on bees and wasps, and you will learn much more than I've been able to share about them. Uh, very enjoyable. Uh, this website here uh, has fantastic photos by local bee expert Sam Drogi. 
uh, you'll get to see close up and personal these macro photos of bees for inspiration. And he has collaborated with Jared Fowler to create this important website um, on pollen specialist bees. So should you want to be more supportive of them, you can see the detailed charts of exactly which uh, bees are gonna be supported by which plants on that website. Uh, if butterfly support is your big interest, I recommend this book uh, that was put out by the Butterfly Association of America. And this week on our uh, Master Gardeners website, we've been posting a whole a series of articles, um, including some puzzles, lots of photos, entertaining uh, information that uh, was written by Mary Free, my colleague. Uh, on our website. And I've also provided links that are going to show you many more uh, close up photographs of all the butterflies. The top website is butterflies native to Northern Virginia. And this other website, you can actually look up butterflies for each state. Uh, should you be looking specifically for the plants? Uh, we have encapsulated all together on one fact sheet referred to as a best bets fact sheet, uh, the, the tried and true plants that we feel are absolutely the best for attracting pollinators. And then uh, there are some, are some other plant lists for the mid-Atlantic. Uh, there was a, a, a list that uh, Jason may be providing uh, uh, in the chat box. It's a site, a site the, uh, from the University of Florida on uh, yet another list for the Mid-Atlantic that is going to be host plants for, uh, for the uh, monarch butterflies. And uh, a talk I gave earlier this year, should you be interested in learning more, especially about the woody plants, the, uh, the trees, um, it was a talk on the keystone species of native plants. So that's going to be focusing especially on the plants that are supportive of our butterflies and moths. And uh, as far as best practices, here's a fabulous prize winning publication. You can access it online written by Mary Free. Uh, I wrote, uh, excuse me, I gave uh, a talk uh, earlier on small space gardening for pollinators. And I have a lengthier discussion about container gardening beginning about one hour into that talk. And you can access that on our website. And my friend, uh, Alyssa Ford Morell has a wonderful talk on uh, hosting butterflies. Uh, as I've mentioned, you'll have the PDF available to you with the relevant slides on garden plans and on container gardening. And I've also provided links to some helpful articles with numerous suggested plant combinations, all kinds of details on using native plants in containers. And finally, I'd like to invite you to visit our demonstration gardens if you're in our area. The Glen Carlin Library Community Garden has that pollinator garden I mentioned, as well as several beds of uh, a monarch way station. And Simpson Park Garden in Alexandria has a dedicated pollinator garden, as well as a butterfly soak that's under construction. And they have uh, many different certifications uh, supporting wildlife. And finally, many folks always want to know where to buy native plants. And I refer you to the Plant Nova Natives website. Uh, it has a list of locally native plants uh, native only sellers, as well as a list of uh, plant sales. So I hope uh, the talk today will give you some tips to help you enjoy watching the pollinators. And I'll take some final questions here. Okay, we do have some questions. Um, someone is looking to make their health strip or right of way more attractive. And they're wondering if there are any pollinating shrubs or flowers they could put there. Yes, um, in one of my other talks, it's one of the general talks on selecting native plants. I have a whole section on health strips, but uh, let me just mention a few right now. Uh, one of the shrubs that can handle those tougher uh, conditions is uh, the New Jersey tea. Ceanothus americanus. It has a very deep taproot, a very deep um, root system, so it can handle those, those drought conditions. Um, plants 
like the the lowest growing of the of the milkweeds, the uh, the butterfly weed, the orange butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa can handle those drought conditions. Um, another plant I haven't mentioned is actually a, a native cactus, the eastern prickly pear, Opuntia humifusa. That one uh, is is very low growing, very drought, drought tolerant and has a lovely large yellow flowers. They, they've been blooming just uh, recently uh, at Glen Carlin. Uh, so those would be some good choices. The Coreopsis, uh, the threadleaf Coreopsis is fairly drought uh, tolerant. Um, lyre leaf sage, um, Salvia lirata, uh, will be very attractive with its little, uh, tubular lavender flowers earlier in the year. And then it will have basal rosettes that are evergreen that will give you a continuous ground cover in that area through the rest of the season. Um, the, the rudbeckias, the, the golden rods, those tend to do well in the, in the drier conditions. So those are just a few examples. Um, on the website, uh, also under uh, our plants menu tab, we have a uh, a section referring to best bets for dry conditions um, and best bets for sun. And those would be two other uh, best bets fact sheets to refer to. Okay, and then someone wanted to know more about the roles ants play. Do they pollinate any plants or they are they helpful in seed dispersal? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, they are not pollinators, but they are very helpful in uh, in the reproduction of those spring ephemerals that I was mentioning. So these would be plants like, um, like, the, like the bloodroot, um, the trilliums. The, the role that the ants play, this whole process is referred to as myrmecockery. What they do is they will collect the seeds of these plants. The seeds are covered by a structure referred to as an eliosome. This is a structure that's a very tasty to them. It's full of nutrients and, uh, and lipids. It's a kind of a fatty covering. So what they'll do is they'll collect the seeds when they are produced by these plants and they will carry them off to their nests. They will consume the eliosome, that, that rich covering, and then the seeds will then have been carried through different parts of the, of the woodland, or if you plant them in your garden, different parts of the garden. So that will, will help disperse them more widely. Okay, great, thanks. Someone else asked, if I see holes in the ground in my yard, should I not cover them up as potential bee holes? Yes, if you look especially at the book on bees, uh, the one by Heather Holm, she talks exactly how to go about recognizing those. I made the, the horrible mistake, I have to admit it, uh, quite a few years ago. I thought anything coming up out of the ground like that was a pest. And I, I was actually spraying them. And uh, I feel very bad to know that, that they were probably native nesting bees that, that I was just seeing innocently emerging. They weren't going to sting me. They weren't going to harm me uh, in any way. Uh, but if you can, uh, try to leave, leave those areas open. Uh, some gardeners suggest maybe seeing if you can leave areas at the back of a bed where they'll be less, of, less visible. But of course, bees will go where, where they, they find the best conditions. So especially if you have those slopes, those more open slopes, you would, would look to, to hold that open. Okay, thanks. There was another question. Is the mosquito spray that we all use on ourselves harmful to pollinators? Uh, I, I don't believe that is. Again, I would re highly recommend reading the, uh, it's a whole series of articles that we have on the website uh, on controlling both mosquitoes and ticks, which I know are another concern in the garden. It's, it's the spraying of these neonics, these, uh, these pesticides. We wouldn't be applying those same products to ourselves. It's, de it's DEET, that's the chemical that we're applying to ourselves. Okay. 
And then there was the question, if you plant natives in your garden, is, is it good or necessary to top it with compost or to fertilize it each year? Most native plants actually are not going to require uh, any kinds of, of fertilizers, uh, chemical fertilizers. In fact, many of them, many of the plants uh, I've mentioned, certainly the native grasses, um, those that grow in those dry, hot conditions, natively grow in what's referred to as lean soil. It's not going to be overly rich. If the soil is overly rich, it may actually cause more flopping. So uh, what you want to do ideally is to do what was um, illustrated in the uh, example I gave with Elisa Mira's garden, to use different layers of plants, the taller plants uh, at the back, uh, whether they be the taller herbaceous plants or the shrubs to give you your structure. Then some of the shorter plants, the, uh, the seasonal plants to, uh, to fill in. Those would be the plants more, uh, maybe the, the two to three foot height, maybe even a little shorter. And then the ground cover plants. And ground cover plants aren't necessarily just the ones that are only maybe four to six inches high. Other plants that spread can be even several feet high. Even a plant uh, like the aromatic aster that's uh, up to three feet high can spread and in a sense act as a ground cover. So ideally you want to try to have these uh, fairly closely placed. Um, so they're interweaving, filling in different niches. And uh, that way, in a sense, you're creating your own mulch. But as you're waiting for that to be established, if you're starting out brand new with a pollinator bed, you may actually even want to use some annuals. Uh, I just heard a wonderful talk yesterday on native annuals that you can use. They're going to be short-lived, but they'll help uh, fill in quickly um, before uh, you get your pollinator garden established. But uh, if you need to at the very beginning, you could use uh, mulch uh, just to, to cover that bare soil. So you're not going to have weeds coming up through that. And if you're using uh, a leaf mulch, that, that's organic matter and that's going to provide um, nutrients. Uh, it's going to enrich the soil and provide nutrients for the plants. One meeting attendee said that they're having trouble trying to grow pussitos. It's mm -hmm. slow. And they're asking, should I plant on a hill for drainage? And if I accidentally um, harm them with weed eater, will it come back? So that's kind of a several part question there. Okay, um, I personally grow uh, pussy toes. It was a little slow to start, but now it's it's actually spreading quite uh, quite a bit. It'll make uh, pretty extensive mats. The important thing is that it's going to want sun, and, and drier conditions. If, it's, if those little um, rosettes, if those little basal rosettes are overly moist, if they are overly covered over with mulch, that may cause them to, to die back and not do so well. So look for, for the right growing conditions. Um, I, well, of course, I would, I would recommend avoiding using herbicides if you possibly can, using cultural methods, you know, hand, hand digging, um, trying to suppress weeds in either with a cardboard or, or mulch, uh, so you don't have to use those chemicals. So I can't be certain as to whether they, they would, would grow back. I mean, an herbicide, again, like the pesticides, doesn't always target just one type of plant. Okay. Another person is asking how they can identify tropical milkweed from good milkweeds in their garden. I would say they should probably go back to this presentation when it's posted in a couple of weeks and look at your pictures. <laughs> yes, I can give, I can give a, a brief description. The, the three types of, of uh, milkweed that I've described are, are very characteristically different. The, the common milkweed has the big clusters of pink flowers. It's also, they're very fragrant. They're very fragrant in the gardens right now. The, uh, the swamp milkweed is going to have flatter clusters of pink flowers. Uh, the leaves aren't nearly as large. They're more el elliptic, about this uh, size. And the, the native uh, butterfly weed the Asclepias tuberosa is, is low growing and it has a bright orange flowers. This tropical milkweed is gonna be closer in height. 
to the swamp milkweed, maybe a couple feet tall. It also has the elliptic leaves. So it's not going to have the large leaves of the common. It's not going to be low like the, like the butterfly weed. And it will have clusters of flowers that are, I think, orange and yellow and red. So kind of a mix of colors rather than either the straight orange of the low native, the straight pink of the swamp milkweed or the clusters of our common milkweed. Okay, and there was a comment um, from one attendee about how difficult it is to contain common milkweed and that she's forever um, uprooting many of them to keep things in check. Yes, I personally don't grow common milkweed. I, I have just found it too aggressive for my garden. There's several things you can do. Of course, once it started spreading, it, it may already be somewhat out of control. Um, there's several things you could do. You could try to plant it in, in containers, so large containers, or somehow put some kind of barrier in the ground so it's not going to be spreading uh, root-wise. You would also then just remove those, those seed pods well before they open up and, and disperse the seeds. That would prevent them from, from spreading through the wind and blowing th that way. Okay, and we had a comment earlier uh, online from an attendee who takes who took issue with a picture you showed of butterfly weed as an example of a food for monarch butterfly larvae. They wanted um, it to be noted for people in attendance that while monarch larvae will feed on a tuberosa, reproducing females lay a few eggs on the plant. And it has to do with chemicals that would help the butterflies, but which do not scare off birds and other predators, making them um, targets. So maybe there's some more reading or research from a scientific um, source that could be looked at. This person for the, in the chat, for people who say that, did list an article link. Okay. Um, when I attended this uh, pollinator symposium yesterday, one of the speakers was talking about the chemicals, those cardenolides that are in the, uh, the milkweed plants, the, the, the ingestion of those, of those chemicals from the plant into the uh, insects is what helps make them um, more, prote more protected. Um, but if you were to refer to that butterfly book that I, I mentioned, maybe as well as this article, there could be more discussion about it. I know I certainly have seen that the caterpillars on feeding on that plant. So that, that's all that I can say about that. Okay, good. Well, thanks for that. Um, that I believe takes care of all the questions. Very good. Okay. So I think we're in good shape. So Elaine, thanks so much for this program. I think it was terrific. I know I learned a lot that will improve my partnership with pollinators in my garden. And you know, I look forward to using a lot of the information that you provided and to probably going back to your resources and checking them out. And we appreciate the entire audience that came today and for your ongoing interest in not only supporting pollinators, but in our ongoing programs that were listed in the chat. Thank you so much, everyone, and happy gardening. <laughs>